I'm going to call the meeting to order. First item is to review and approve the agenda, and we have one change, which was to move up uh, the uh, accessory dwelling unit program um, to right after the uh, appointments, so that will be something like item seven and a half. Uh, Which so. are all the accessory dealt with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so any other changes to the agenda? Okay, so without uh, objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. So on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on some topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would uh, state your name and your uh, address uh, and try to keep your comments to two minutes or less. And that is true for other items throughout the evening if you try to keep your comments to two minutes or less. Donna will time. Okay, we move on. Uh, so consideration of the consent agenda. Is there a, a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. I'll second it. Further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, great. Oh, I'm gonna vote aye. <laughs> Because yes. there are only four of us. Super. All right, thank you. Um, so on to appointments. So we have a number of appointments to make tonight. So let's we're just going to take these linearly uh, as they appear on the agenda. So the first uh, one is for the Public Art Commission. I know we have a few appointments uh, to make there. Now, to be fair, just so you people are aware, uh, we'll hear... Um, from all the people who are up for appointments uh, together, and then we'll go into one executive session to consider them all, and then we'll come back and make uh, all of the appointments at the same time. So any um, members of the uh, up for appointment to the Public Art Commission want to come introduce themselves? Yeah, come on up. Uh, I believe there are five uh, applicants. Yeah, if you'd introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in this uh, commission. Mm. <laughs> uh, I'm Nathan Suter and uh, resident of Montpelier. Thank you for having us. Um, I will confess I just pulled back into town from a day with the family, so I'm just hoping for a few months. Could you thoughts. talk into the mic? Because I'm, I'm this close and I can't hear you. Sorry, Donna. <laughs> That's um, okay. <laughs> uh, so... I'm an artist. I have worked, I ran an arts organization in Stowe for 10 years. I've been involved a little bit in some arts organization work here in town, uh, which I've enjoyed. And I just feel very strongly about the power of art in public places and uh, a community that is a cultural center. Uh, I think that's a, that's a powerful engine for our community and a potentially powerful piece of identity. Uh, and uh, the more that we, as a community, support arts and culture, I think the healthier we'll be and the more visitors will attract and the more residents will attract and retain. So those are some of my motives. Uh, I think among other things that I talked about in my proposal or application was um, about, I, I talked about communication and the need for people on the commission, I think, to both uh, to communicate well with sort of their own network and also constituents in general about uh, the activities of the council of the commission. Uh, I talked about um, sort of strategic thinking and I think a commission like this, especially in its first years, will be doing some near term, you know, close business and then some long term thinking about what the work of the council or commission should be and what it can be and how it might be funded and who we should try to bring in as allies to help move things forward. And uh, I enjoy both that, uh, the near term, immediate practical thinking and as well as the longer term uh, strategic thinking about how choices the commission might make in the, in the first year will affect things further down. Uh, and then I also talked about process and I have a strong belief in practice that good intentional process creates good outcomes and leads to inclusion and uh, also makes it easy to explain 
the choices that any commission makes to the public. And I think that that's, that's important. If we're serving the public, we need to be able to explain what we're doing and how we're doing it and why. And um, anyway, so those, those are powerful tools. And that's the, that's, those are some of the things I would bring to the commission should I be lucky enough to be selected. Thank you. Hi, <coughs> Hi I'm Bob Hamm. And uh, my wife and I, Bonnie, been there, moved to Montpelier about two years ago. And uh, we're following our grandchildren here. And I've been um, installing and repairing sculpture for over 40 years all over the world. And I still do that. And I'm, I'm just thrilled with this city. I love it. And I want to get more involved. And the best way I can get involved, I think, is to share my art experiences. And I actually work with Nathan on the selection committee for our uh, public art at the uh, Transit Center. And uh, it was a wonderful process, so I just want to get more involved. And I think, uh, uh, to be brief about this, I think the best thing I can bring to our commission and to you folks is <coughs> the sense of wanting to meet with other art leaders in other cities and really gather the best ideas. What's working in other cities to make them really vital art communities? Because uh, as as Nathan mentioned, and I totally agree. In my experience, the arts have really driven communities. They've really become the, uh, the foundation of a great community. So um, that's, that's what I wanted to emphasize in my proposal is the effort to gather ideas, the best ideas, and bring them forth. Okay. Any questions for these guys? Thank you for being willing to serve. <laughs> Any thank other? Uh, thank you. Uh, you don't have to hang out thank here. Thank you for the coffee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, any other uh, uh, applicants to the Arts Public Arts Commission? Okay. Um, so next is the tree board, and I know we have at least one person here. If you're, um, yeah, do you want to come up and just introduce yourself? <laughs> Good evening. I'm John Akulashik. I've been with the Tree Board uh, as a volunteer starting in 2012, and I've had two, two three-year terms, and so I'm up for another three-year term. Continue working to beautify the city by the planting of trees and protecting the ones that we have, and looking forward to <coughs> battling the bugs that would destroy them. <laughs> so. If you had any questions for me or not. Any questions? No question, but I just want to commend you again for your work on the Emerald Ash Borer Plan. That was above and beyond, and we really appreciate thank it. You. Great, thank you. Any other uh, applicants to the uh, tree board? Okay. Uh, all right, the Conservation Commission. I think uh, there's only one person, and I don't see him here. So... We're going to move on from the Conservation Commission. Um, all right, that that is it for the appointments. Oh, yes. Do you want to come up and just so that people at home can hear you? Hi, it's Nathan Sewell. I'm curious to know if you can just read who on my third group is who are applying to the Arts Commission. Sure. I suppose the same for the Tree Board. Sure, great questions. Um, so applying for the uh, Public Arts Commission, there are five people for four seats. Um, Alyssa Dworsky, uh, Robert Hannum, Ward Joyce, Susan Rexford Winston, and, and yourself, Nathan Suter. And uh, for the tree board, um, they, I think there were, they, yeah, there were six seats for five, and five applicants, um, so that was, uh, John Asulashik, did I say your name right? Close. Okay. No. Okay. John. <laughs> John. Okay. I was I was taking notes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Steve Bailey, Sarah Hoffmeyer, Jeff Schumann, and John Snell. Uh, and for the Conservation Commission, there was a, a alternate seat as well as a regular seat that were up. And Michael Lazicek, who uh, was an alternate, is applying for the regular. Uh, the regular seat there. 
I think that's it. Cool. All right. So uh, is there a motion to go? Yeah. Pursuant to 1 BSA Section 313A3, I move that we go into executive session to consider the appointment of a public officer. I'll second that. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, and I also vote aye. Oh, no, wait, I don't have to. All right, do we have a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. Second. Um, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Uh, okay, I move that we appoint to the Montpelier Public Art Commission Elisa Dworsky, Robert Hannum, Suzanne Rexford Winston, and Nathan Souter to the tree board uh, John Akirashik, <coughs> Steve Bailey, Sarah Hoffmeyer, Jeff Schumann, and John Snell. And as a regular uh, seat on the Conservation Commission, Michael Azorczak. Is there a second? Second. For the discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you all to, to all who applied and I'm looking forward to, to working with you all. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, on to, oh, so uh, we're gonna jump now to the uh, accessory dwelling unit program. Um, so, Kevin, I'll let you I'll take it away and introduce people and, sure. great. Do you have a presentation? No, okay, let, let, you're not like We are the anything. presentation. You are, great, <laughs> super. All right, good evening, uh, Kevin Casey with Community Development. Um, and Tyler Moss and Richard Williams from the Vermont State Housing Authority. Um, just to give a little background, uh, uh, Tyler and I started conversations uh, about a month ago um, about this uh, starting a um, accessory dwelling unit program. Um, and uh, this was an idea. This was a program that the city had. A very similar program. Um, except that uh, this program comes with uh, a lot more experience. Um, Tyler's been doing this for how many years? In? A while. A while, <laughs> yeah, a number of years in Brattleboro. Um, and the, the issue before us tonight is, uh, is asking for support. We, we are looking to apply um, for about $400,000 in community development block grant funds to the state. Um, there is a resolution that needs to be signed in order to proceed with that. Uh, we have had substantive conversations with the state and they're very supportive um, and this will help meet our housing goals and infill and energy efficiency and a number of other things um, that the council has uh, been supportive of in the past um, and so I will let Tyler explain uh, the proposal and, um, and and where we go from there just as an aside uh, the plan is for our grant match will be um, uh, to use some of the community development block grant funds, uh, or sorry, the community development revolving loan funds that we discussed at the last council meeting that it will be reorganized, um, kind of giving us an opportunity to, with that, with the flexibility I mentioned to fund a program like this um, or our match for the program. Can I ask you about that real quick? So, sure. um, is the, uh, I, you have two numbers um, written down here. Um, one is uh, the required expenditure is 50,000. Is that the match or is that? The that would total? be our match. So the general proposal, well, the budget's still being worked on, so this is preliminary, would be that uh, the city would, would contribute uh, from its revolving loan funds 50,000. The state housing authority w is planning on putting up 100,000. Okay. And then the state uh, uh, Vermont Community Development Program, um, which m manages the CDBG funds, we were requesting 400,000. All right, great, thank you. Sure. And Tyler, I'll let him take it away and explain what the program is <coughs> and um, how we will be successful. Huh. All right. <laughs> well, we're gonna be successful, so that's not even an issue. Yeah. There we go. So, um, my name is Tyler Moss. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. And uh, I've been working with Brattleboro Area Affordable Housing for the past six years, think about it for a second, but uh, and for about five years, 
I've been running their Apartments and Homes program, which is, creates accessory dwelling units, or ADUs. Um, in the past four or five years, we, I've helped homeowners create 16 apartments. We have a 17th one work in progress right now in the Brattleboro area. And that's been, we are an all-volunteer board, so that's a very notable difference between what this program is would like it to be and what the program is in Brattleboro. We've uh, long thought that being able to devote time and a lot of additional money to a program, then uh, we'd be able to ramp that up because there is, there are people that want to do it, there is the, the need for it, but the time and energy to do it um, is, wasn't quite there. What we propose for the City of Montpelier is a two-year program that will help to create 10 uh, accessory dwelling units in the city of Montpelier. Um, it'll be a collaboration between the city of Montpelier, the state housing authority, and the Department of Housing and Community Development, the Community Development Block Grant. Um, what we would do is uh, identify eligible uh, applicants and to become participants in the program, and they would be there would be an intake program through Vermont State Housing Authority, which is what we do a lot of. So we're very well versed at that. And um, after that, we would uh, identify likely participants, go and look at projects, and hopefully uh, enter into a gr an agreement with them uh, once we know that the financing is in place to do the project through um, different sources, uh, then we would move forward with the program. The way the financing would work on our part was uh, so the Vermont State Housing Authority has $100,000 to put towards a revolving loan that would be available to participants uh, in <coughs> before the project starts. Great way to start the project with money. Um, so that's up to $10,000 per project. And after the project's completion, uh, all costs that were associated with the, pro with the project would be reimbursed at 50% up to a maximum grant of twenty thousand um, dollars. So if you spend thirty thousand dollars, you'd be eligible for a fifteen thousand dollar grant, etc. Up to twenty thousand um, dollars. We would like to see this program also uh, spread out through the state. This is being looked at as a pilot program, and so you know it takes almost as much time and effort to make one pancake as it does to make ten. So this is going to be the start. Um, and so we're hoping that you know, we'll get a lot of the kinks worked out. We've worked out a lot of them in Brattleboro. Um, and I know that there was a program here in uh, Montpelier uh, that some people will be drawing comparisons to. But I, I'd like to focus on some of what the differences are from what I know. Kevin will know more about that if there are any more specific questions. But mostly, um, that was a loan for soft costs. So uh, design and permitting costs mostly is what I understand. It wasn't there wasn't as much construction. Well, like there were some. I think one of the general challenges, and I've mentioned this before, is there were a few factors at play. One, the maximum award was forty five hundred dollars, and the original concept was to offset the cost of the sprinklers. Um, and so uh, there was a lot. It, it was administratively heavy for the homeowner, and the reward wasn't that great. Um, uh, and also, kind of looking at it historically, there's, as far as staff on the city side, there was a tremendous amount of turnover in that period of time um, due to illnesses and um, um, uh, people leaving. So there was, there was a lot of turnover. So that program wasn't, um, there were elements of it which were great, but it, it never took off. I think that what we have, and I had mentioned this to, to Jack at one point, was that between Tyler's expertise with this and the staff that we have in, in, the, in the department, between myself and, and Chris Lumbra and Mike, we all have enough experience in these types of things to, to, to help move the homeowner forward. So I think there's been a number of changes from zoning to sprinkler ordinances to other things that, that makes it so that the administrative issues that some of the homeowners kind of felt were cumbersome kind of out of the way now so and this is Come not on. just for soft costs anymore this could actually go for some capital correct and one of the keys I think is this is the is the two pieces so they're uh, you know having um, money available for some of the soft costs for an architect who can provide that experience 
um, and the, the, the drive to get a, a project done. Um, you know, they usually will handle most of the, you know, zoning issues or building inspectors and things like that and take some of that pressure off of the homeowner. And then this capital, coupled with uh, the homeowner's uh, capital, you know, you've got a, uh, a enough money to actually do a unit. Uh, $4,500, if you've ever done home renovations, <laughs> you, know, you, might, you're, you might get a couple switches um, <laughs> and at the end of the day. So, you know, when you're talking about putting in um, kitchens and baths, uh, you know, you're talking a fair amount of money. But with the rental rates, um, even at affordable rental rates, um, if the homeowner is affordable, um, if with this grant offsetting half your costs, it, it you know, you've got payoff periods which could be, you know, less than two years. Less than two years. So if you're a homeowner, um, and particularly if you're a senior homeowner, one of the things about this is that um, we are required uh, under these funds that uh, six out of ten of the, the grants must be to somebody who is lower moderate income, meaning they're below 80% of the area median income. Um, one of the advantages is is that you, if you are a senior, you're considered a presumed LMI. So if we have homeowners, which we have plenty of that are senior citizens over 65, they will qualify um, on the income basis. So. You know, when we have, we talk about downsizers or people who are interested in this, this is a great program. Um, and they can leverage some of their own home equity with this program and we get more units. So I'm excited because I think, I think that it's tremendous. I think the housing task force was, was very supportive, um, liked the idea and uh, yeah, I think that it's gonna be something special. I think so too, and like you were saying, the, uh, the in Montpelier, one of the largest uh, segment of homeowners is between the age of 65 and 74 um, years of age. And the largest group of renters are those that rent one bedroom or studio apartments. So it kind of seems to lend itself to that. Also Montpelier is, um, has one of the, it has the, one of the highest median monthly homeowner costs in Vermont, um, as well as tax costs but has um, one of the lowest average household sizes as well, and a lot of empty rooms in homes. So mm -hmm. it really, that's why uh, Montpelier was the perfect place to start this, and it's also a, a little bit uh, <coughs> regulation heavy compared to some towns in Vermont, <laughs> which is good. That's what we want. We want our people to look at it and, and have eyes on it. Or, you know, some places don't even have zoning laws at all. They just go ahead and build. Um, so it's a nice, nice place to, to start that out. Sorry, uh, Rosie. Yeah. I've got some questions if yeah, you're. Absolutely. Um, so there was something in the memo about um, at-risk youth, and I didn't really understand what was going on with that. Um, well, I mean, that's just uh, one of the people that will the target populations that might fit. They're usually going to uh, have no, no income. Uh, that's the, the so they would fit as far as. Um, for potential That's renters? For potential sure. renters. And, okay. you know, the, all, the final decision for a tenant would be left up to the homeowner. You know, um, we're hoping to find as much eligibility in the homeowner process and not in the tenant process. We don't want to force people to rent to somebody. I think that's what's going to leave a sour taste in people's mouths. So you have to rent to this person who has no money. <laughs> you know, that's, that would well, scare people away. So um, the at-risk youth, I think part of it also, we're, we're trying to target that is the, the housing authority has recently been uh, issuing vouchers for at-risk youth. Uh, they're, they're coming out quickly, and so there's a lot of these people that will have uh, assistance, could, could possibly have assistance through the state or through a voucher program, maybe with uh, Montpelier Housing Authority or somewhere they can rent these units. So it would be guaranteed income, so that would relieve uh, some of the you know, worry from the homeowner. Okay. That's um, and then there was also a thing in the memo about the homeowner would be eligible for up to fifty thousand dollars, and I'm wondering if that was a typo because you just said twenty thousand dollars. I see thirty. So it says uh, thirty thousand in uh, the fifty thousand was uh, asking oh, yeah. for the revolving loan from from the city. Okay, I must have and the thirty thousand yeah. is the total um, amount of eligible grants and loans. Uh, we've, we've clarified that in our proposal, actually. So the initial ten, so it's, and it's then ten thousand, and then up, up, up to, to twenty thousand. 
And so they could use that um, if they got a twenty thousand dollars. Say, say it was a twenty thousand dollar project. They got ten thousand up front. They put up ten thousand of their own through a home equity line of credit or a credit card or savings or whatever. They'd be able then they'd get ten thousand back on that, and they'd be able to pay off their loan. And so they'd be they would mm -hmm. be at, um, and with a ten thousand dollar expense. That's almost that's a, a year of renting a one bedroom at eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm curious about the decision to make all seniors presumed low, in, low and moderate that's income. A, that's not a decision. That's actually a, that's a standard set by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Huh, okay. It's a HUD standard. Yeah, it's, and a HUD it's, standard. Yeah. it's also true of the disabled. If you are disabled, you are um, presumed LMI. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and there's, uh, I think there's emancipated youth. There's, some, there's yeah. a lot there's of people. There's, I think so seven, you're going to use the pre-existing definitions in order to grant out? Okay. If you're presumed LMI. Sorry, what is LMI? Low and moderate income. Low, Low or moderate, moderate income. income. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and AMI. <laughs> area median income. Area median income, right, right, right. Exactly. Uh, so I had a procedure question. Do we need both a motion to develop and give you authorization to develop, implement, or just a motion for the resolution? Uh, a motion for the resolution um, uh, because the first <coughs> Part of this process is once we have this resolution tomorrow morning, I'll open up the the, the grant program and we start writing it uh, right away because this is due April sixteenth. April sixteenth, and then for a June board meeting, the hope is, and we had a um, a good meeting last week with the with the folks at the state who are very supportive of this idea, um, is that we could roll this out relatively quickly. Um, so, Stephen, if you could write an article on that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, no pressure. Uh, so, I, you know, it is one, one thing that we have discussed is that trying to get this, uh, uh, it, it, you know, if we get the funding in June, to hit the ground running because of construction seasons and a few other things. So, um, you know, I can help Tyler with that, with <coughs> kind of the local connections with architects, designers, uh, builders, and... Yeah, we want to get the word out there a little earlier. We, we got to be careful about how we get the word out there, saying, hey, we got $30,000 to build an apartment. We're going to get a lot of phone calls that we don't yeah. want. So it's, it's going to be, we're going to have to think about our marketing strategy and how we're, how we're going to do that. But we also want to, There's this is the planning season for building. So people are thinking about it right now. And unfortunately, uh, according to uh, the Department of Housing for the grant, if they've even torn up a corner of rug, it's a project in process and does not qualify. So wow. don't pull up the corners <laughs> of your rugs. <laughs> Put the well, screws back in the wall. So mud up the holes. Thank you for asking that because it seems like this is a great pro program and we should just be moving forward. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the marketing aspect of it because that was one thing I um, was curious about. Um, because it seems like this has a, a lot of just great potential and uh, I'm, uh, I mean one problem that we could have is that you get too many calls. The other problem we could have is we don't get enough. And um, I, I mean, this, this is just me, and I, I don't know uh, how you all would feel about it, but like I would rather have the problem of having too many calls than not enough, and so I would rather lean on the side of um, really getting the word out there. And I, I'm interested in making sure that um, that, that happens, and um, potentially I, uh, we have uh, Laura Gebhardt here from the Development Corporation, and if there's any coordination that can happen there, that could be great. Um, but anyway, um, I would love to, to uh, I mean, my, my gut is to make a big deal out of this. <laughs> but uh, I, But we have to get the money first. Yeah, yeah so fair enough. Well, will you tell us when? Make a very controlled big deal out yeah, of it. Yeah, well, fair enough. And um, uh, Well, I think that it, uh, there, there could very well be too much interest in it, mm -hmm. and um, we will have to work on developing a wait list, which is another thing that we do a lot of. We have thousands of people on a wait list, actually, mm -hmm. that we're working with every day. Uh, and like I used the example before, uh, $20,000, we had a lot of, pro that's, that's the average cost of a project that happened in Brattleboro was $20,000. We had a lot of things that happened, they were already these sort of in-law apartments or a base, something that had been converted into a bedroom or there's a bathroom attached to it, so you're just looking at putting in a kitchenette. Um, these can turn around pretty quickly. There's you know, a lot of uh, you know, smaller contractors that charge very reasonable rates, and they can, we, if we can get a $20,000 project, that's a $10,000 grant, so we still have more money. So what we'd look to, I think, instead of just 
giving back the money, <laughs> we would look to extend the term of the mm -hmm. program yeah. and to continue on doing it uh, with whatever money left and then eventually uh, yep. ask for more. So I assume yeah. for <laughs> more. Yeah, fair enough. Well, well, and how long it will it go on for right. uh, that's, <laughs> that's 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 hard to say. Uh, we'd like to see it continue. Whether or not it continue <coughs> with this level of funding would be... Um, well, I would just love it's to um, check in, uh, you know, as it's going on to hear how it's going and, um, you know, if you're getting too many calls or too few calls, that would just be good to know and it doesn't necessarily need to be like a time where you come to the council, but just some kind of like an email update I think would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Yeah. Evan? Cool. So then this is a sort of a strange title because it's the resolution for downtown transportation fund grant there's two you have two resolutions okay <laughs> but it does talk about the housing authority within it Which one? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, department of Hous housing and community development oh, yeah that's, that's, that's a different grant that's different people. okay then i'll use the language that's in the, uh, well, the agenda are we going to be signing that tonight? You said yeah. a resolution. I don't see it among it's, our. It's right here because we all haven't oh. approved it yet. Okay. Yeah, John has. Uh, all right. I'd like to make a motion that we s uh, approve the resolution for the development of this pilot access dwelling unit program in Montpelier, Vermont. Accessory. Do you need Second. Anything yeah. more? Uh, nope. That's probably. I think that's fine. So the uh, moving the resolution. Um, all right. So for the discussion, uh, Chris. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Come on. Uh, Peter Kelman. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, as a member of the Montpelier Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee and as a former member of the Montpelier Housing Task Force, I personally strongly endorse this program. It appears to be totally consistent with the goals of increasing the availability of affordable housing uh, and doing so in a way that actually will be more dispersed uh, throughout the city, which I think is very important for affordable housing. In addition, it will help homeowners, uh, particularly ones who are feeling stressed by increased costs, taxes, and whatever, uh, to have some uh, mitigating uh, income from this, using spaces in their homes that are increasingly too large for them uh, to, uh, to actually to generate that income. And as uh, Kevin mentioned, this is particularly, I think, important for seniors. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, I recently taught a course uh, at, the, at the Senior Center on aging in place, and one of the big issues for people is that their houses are just too big, but they can't, they don't feel they can afford to do the duplexing or the creation of ADUs. So, uh, a, a strong endorsement. I have a lot of questions uh, uh, de about details, but th those will come with time. Thank you, Peter. All right, there's a motion and a second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Looking forward thank to you, this. Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Okay, the Emerald Ash Borer Plan. Welcome back to the table. <laughs> Do you want to introduce hey, yourself? Hey, I'm John Atkilosic with the Tree Board, recently reappointed. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> and uh, just we're here to discuss the uh, Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan, the idea being that we'd like to manage the bug instead of letting the bug manage us. <laughs> and it's a 10-year plan to try to do that. Uh, we can't stop the emerald ash borer. Uh, that's not going to be possible. But we can slow it down, and we can make it such that the impacts to the city and to private uh, residents of the city with ash trees on their property are somewhat controlled. and. Uh, the whole purpose of the plan is to lay out how we do that. And I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the plan or if you had a chance to read it. It's about 20, 21 pages. Uh, but uh, what it calls for is basically a uh, survey 
on an annual basis of the trees in the right of way of the city to identify where the bug is spreading. Um, currently, we know that the bug was up at National Life. We know from examining the trees that were cut down at National Life that some adults have left that tr those trees and have moved over to some other trees. We don't know if they just moved across the road or if they <coughs> decided to take advantage of some wind and fly to other parts of the city. We'll know a little bit better in the spring when the, the leaves come out on the ash trees as to which trees may have been impacted. Uh, again, the bug's been around for a few years. You don't notice it right away. And so chances are it may be in other areas of the city. We surveyed the right-of-way trees last year uh, uh, with the tree board, parks, and volunteers, <coughs> and volunteers are essential to this. We identified 450 right-of-way trees uh, in the city, looked at those, probably found about a half a dozen that were suspicious, maybe a half a dozen to a dozen that looked like they may have something going on. Um, Parks folks, Alec uh, Ellsworth, uh, did a little br branch sampling, which is a way to look for the bug in living trees and didn't find any. So, um, so far so good, but we're anticipating the resurvey this spring will uh, identify some trees where they have been uh, affected by the bug. And uh, the plan, again, it's a 10 year plan, so it calls for removing about 10% of the ash trees each year on average. Uh, it may be that the first few years you don't remove as many because the bug hasn't taken off or we've been able to slow it. Uh, but eventually the ash trees are going to have to come down because they will die and when they die they become very brittle and dangerous. They break at a, you know, with the wind or uh, they're very difficult for arborists to remove because uh, they tend to, to be brittle that way and they cost a lot more to remove once they're fully dead, so it's better to remove them when they're partially affected. Uh, so the 10 year plan calls for about 45 a tr trees a year. Um, and the other part of this is that on private property, we've estimated that there's 2,700 ash trees on residential lots. I know I have four, at least four on my property. Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of people that are gonna be affected by this. Eventually the, the bug will spread. Uh, so, uh, again, the plan is to slow it and maybe spread it out over many years as, as opposed to doing nothing and letting it take over our trees in eight to ten years. And with that, I guess, that's an overview. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, any, I'll, uh, I'll answer any questions, questions you may have. have. Sure. But just that I appreciated this, although it's very dense to read. But that, that you did mention, like, you know, some places are trying those wasps and that you're going to be looking at if the current substance that we're using is still good or something better. So I like that aspect that you're staying open to other solutions than the one you started with. Right, exactly. That's really the, the idea is with, with the, uh, the parasitoid wasps uh, to see how that develops. It may be that you have to build up a concentration of those guys that's fairly large to have them effective because the uh, emerald ash borer can produce 100 eggs per female. And you can see how ec that will take off exponentially uh, if you don't do anything uh, to, s to slow them down. Right, you so don't want to create another problem while trying to solve the well, first one. Yeah, we're, there's, there's other things that are going on. There's, there's still research being done in the US and Canada on other methods of, of control that we're going to be keeping an eye on and seeing if it's applicable to the Montpelier situation. Uh, yeah. Just the other thing, I did pass this on to John Snell, that I've had a constituent reach out really sensitive right. to wanting to make sure they're notified where they're going to be uh, treating the it's trees, a, even though it's not a spray. There's right. still people who are very sensitive and need to know. So yeah, he copied me on that yeah. email, and, and we will be uh, very sensitive to that, that yeah. need. Uh, John Snell, by the way, does pass along his regrets that he had a scheduling conflict, so he couldn't be here today. Uh, Glenn. Um, still on the, the uh, injection for the, the 15 <coughs> street trees, uh, can you tell me anything more about that 
chemical in particular. I feel like there's a, a fair amount of good information about the the bad neonicotinoids, but I right. didn't see a lot about the relatively good stuff that we would right. use. This, it's, it's called triage, amamectin benzoate. Yeah. It's the preferred insect, uh, insecticide for the emerald ash borer in this country. Um, uh, it will uh, become a systemic insecticide in that it spreads to the roots, the trunk, and the leaves. And uh, the idea being when the adults hatch out, they go into the canopy to have a meal of leaves. And if your tree is systemically protected, they'll eat those leaves and die. And so those guys are removed from the population. So that's the concept between uh, about uh, the injection. And uh, it's, this is relatively targeted to this particular species or to beetles in general, or? It, it, it's, it's targeted to the insects that will prey upon the ash trees. It, it Got can, it. Yeah, you can't just kill one bug. The idea being here is that we're protecting our ash trees long enough to have other trees grow and provide a canopy. So it's a 10-year plan. We're planting more trees, maybe two to one for what we'll be losing, but it's not, a, it's not a permanent solution. It's a temporary solution so that we don't lose these trees, which are our largest trees downtown, right off the bat. And that could happen. And just to make it perfectly clear to myself, any insect, other insects included, that chooses to eat this tree will die. That's correct. Uh, that, is, but that, is, that is very likely. <laughs> right. It yes. It's, it's just that uh, it, this is less uh, dangerous for bees, for example, than oh, neonicotinoids. Definitely. definitely, yes. Um, and most bugs that want to eat the ash tree will be... EABs and therefore we want to kill well, them anyway. Well, <laughs> I have, to, in all honesty, yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you that it's been found that there's a hundred different insects that are dependent upon ash trees. So when our ash trees go, all those bugs are out of luck, right? So we're doing this just to protect the canopies of the trees downtown. We know it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a permanent solution. Maybe something will come along down the road, it's a 10 year plan, who knows where we'll be in eight to 10 years. There may be something that we can do other than the insecticide. But that's, that's the best alternative at this point for those trees now. And it's the downtown trees plus any legacy trees that we may have in the park that are worth saving, like the one up at the old shelter, for instance, that I keep mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> but green ash trees especially are susceptible. And that's most of our big trees downtown are green. Glenn, I was sent an insecticide brochure from John Snell that I can forward to Bill and get it distributed because it gives you options of insecticides and talks about this. It's very helpful. I should point out that the insecticide we're, we came to, con to conclude to use, independent of the state, is the same exact that the state gave. We did our own research on these insecticides at the tree board. Everybody took an insecticide, went into the literature, and we came to conclusions and then we looked at what the state was recommending, and it turned out to be exactly the same thing. So. Good. Um, I was just glad to see that uh, you know, as the uh, ash trees die off, I um, you know noticed the um, guidelines in there about you know you're not going to uh, be populating uh, or replanting any one species in total. Oh, the diversity. The diversity. Aspect, yeah, yeah, we're that's, trying. That's we're, great. we're figuring it out finally. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, I, I don't have any other questions. Um, so if there's any other thoughts, do we have a motion? I would move to adopt the newly updated uh, Emerald Ash Borer Plan. I'll second it. Great. So motion to adopt this uh, Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan. Uh, further discussion? Oh, and budget proposal. I'm sorry. I missed that. Need to do it. That's okay. That's okay, great. Um, all right. Any comments from the public? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you very yes. much. Okay, and on to the zoning. So we've been hearing about some 
uh, zoning changes here. So, All right. and you do have a presentation, right? I have a quick presentation. Okay, so I'm going to move. Your choices today. I do. As we know, Connor will not be back. Right. I don't know if we'll need to kill the lights. You can kill the lights on, right? Let me actually go. Oh, you let them off. Well, okay. whatever works for our audience. Did you want to turn the bulb? Yeah, it's gone. It's For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Mike Miller. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development here for the city. And um, for the past year, as uh, just as a quick history, so we are uh, one year, a little more than a year, into working with the new zoning regulations. The zoning rewrite was adopted last January 3rd. Um, it was a complete rewrite. So uh, even as much as you can proofread and get things ready to go, um, once you start using it, you start to realize there are a couple of hiccups here and there that need to be addressed. So we found many small issues and a couple of big ones. Um, and that's what we're talking about tonight are the two, the two big ones. Um, the staff in my office assembled a repair list of about 100 edits sent them to the Planning Commission, and they have approved the fixes to the slopes and landscaping that we'll talk about tonight um, that are needed more quickly because they're having a direct impact on applications. So we're, we're losing out on what we would consider a, a unintended consequences. These are good projects or projects we believe should be moving forward that aren't able to right now. Um, so what we're asking is to um, review and have a hearing and approve an interim zoning change to fix the slopes and landscaping. And I'll go through both of those. Uh, it is, it'll be warned as an emergency zoning uh, change because that is the, the legal technical uh, thing in statute, but it really is, uh, interim zoning allows you to make a, a short change for a period of time not to exceed two years. Um, and we don't expect it to last more than a couple of months because um, we are already working to permanently adopt all the rest of them. But that process, as you are well aware from the zoning, takes time. Um, there's uh, hearing periods uh, for the Planning Commission and City Council and 30-day notices to the state. And so there are a number of things that just naturally make the adoption process take longer. And we would really like to get these two changes through quickly and then they will be back up with the bigger permanent adoption in um, April, probably May, where you would start to see it. So, um, so really quickly, the changes um, which you did receive um, strikeout copies of. So the slopes change, if you took, took a look at it, there was not too many changes to it. Uh, the changes were actually in the two figures. And the problem that existed was that in the previous zoning, or in the current zoning, 30% slopes are prohibited from development. Uh, you can't develop 30% slopes. But as it turns out, once we started working with developers and projects, as we found these 30% slopes just kept popping up everywhere in small amounts retaining walls, roadside ditches, and as written, we couldn't approve making a new driveway. 
because the slopes that are on the, that are ditched on the sides of your roads are three to one slopes, which are 30% slopes. And they ex usually extend to the left and right more than 500 square feet. So they would automatically prevent, and it, and it basically did prevent one project from being able to move forward. Um, we, we hope that project will come back once the 30% prohibition is removed. Um, and it was simply because they couldn't put a driveway in. So what we did in this proposal was simply the current zoning says you cannot develop 30% slopes. And what we did was change that to read that if you want to develop 30% slopes, it's going to require a hearing. So that means neighbors would get a, 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 a notice. And it would require an engineered plan. So you have to hire an engineer if you're going to affect 30% slopes. Those plans get reviewed by our public works department and provide comments to the DRB. So it's it's a um, it's a, a, a rigorous process that we would look at for these changes to 30% slopes. It's not intended to simply open up um, development of a lot of these 30% slopes. It's just meant to give us that opportunity. All projects that affect them will have to go through um, and. So the two things, um, and then this, this will be all I'll have on the slopes, and if you have questions, we can go through it. What is not changing, um, because there was imp an impression that we got from some people that we were not going to regulate slopes at all. So as I pointed out, that's not true. We are removing the prohibition and replacing it with a requirement for engineering and hearing. And the second thing this will not address is buildable area calculations people who are new on the council and may not know, the, the zoning had a rule that said we would calculate density based on the buildable area of a, of a lot, not on the parcel size. Because this is an interim quick process and it's got an abbreviated public comment period, the Planning Commission didn't feel comfortable moving it forward, um, so they held back that piece, which is proposed to be changed, but um, it's going to be it's going to go through the full adoption process. So the buildable area is not going to be changed with this interim zoning change. Only this requirement that says you can develop 30% slopes. If that makes sense. So it looks like in the strikeout that you also changed um, the uh, square footage. Um, that would yes. be impacted. I, I'm sorry, I should, have, I should have been clear about that. So the other thing that we did change were those numbers. What we looked at um, and, and kind of surprised us a little bit was that the threshold for um, engineered plans um, so what was it? So the the threshold for one, we, we thought the numbers were reversed when we finally got to look at them. So, um, for example, less than 15% slopes, no more than 4%, uh, 4,000 square feet of land can be disturbed without an engineered plan. And disturbing 8,000 would require a hearing. So what it was before was reversed. So you would first go to a hearing but not be required to bring an engineer. and we of felt that we would rather have it the other way around where if it was disturbing let's say 5,000 square feet it's still an administrative permit downstairs but Meredith would like to see that engineered plan it's not going to go to a public hearing but it will um, you'll still need to provide that to Meredith so she can work with DPW to make sure that um, concerns about slope and slope stability are met for a 15 to 20 percent slope. So we just felt when we started to look at these numbers that they should be switched. So just to be devil's advocate, I, I mean the hearing is free potentially, the engineered plan is not. So from the perspective of a potential uh, property owner or developer, it seems like that could actually be more of a burden. I mean you probably, depending on what project you're doing, mm -hmm you might be doing a plan anyway, in which case it's not a burden. But if you're not, paying an engineer to design, you know, 20 feet of driveway might be. 
Yes. So the purpose for us switching those wasn't to save homeowners money or to save applicants money. The purpose on that one was simply to go and look at the logic behind um, when, what would we want to see first as, as the threshold and as the disturbance is increasing from you know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 feet, what would we want to have happen first? Would we first want to make an applicant go to a hearing without an engineer? Or would we first rather have them get the engineer and do the engineering work? And if it gets even more expansive, we would expand to a hearing. And that was the thought of where the planning commission was going. So it wasn't really about necessarily the cost. Okay. Sorry, if you had more to say. So that was it for slopes. Okay. Uh, let's take this uh, piecewise. So any comments or questions about the slopes? Good evening, Joe Castellano, Saving Street. Can you guys hear me? Is this? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, my only comment was, um, you know, I know Mike's put a lot of work into this. And I know that you've obviously had some pushback from some of the developers and builders and stuff. Is there any way you can write the language just to exempt what it seemed to be the issue, like the retaining walls of driveways, as opposed to the blanket 30%, uh, not allowing building all over 30%? Because I think there's some concerns from a lot of you know, people I talk to as far as soil erosion and uh, water runoff and stuff like that. I know you tried to address it. Uh, I, the, the, what comes into an engineered plan is going to be addressing uh, a number of things, including stability of the soil and the, uh, oil and the erosion control plan. Erosion will be looked at a, in, a sec, in a second section as well. Um, so. I think 3007 is steep slopes. I think 08, I think, is erosion control. Gotcha. OK. So um, there's a second, a second round of, of looking at those. We, f we thought this was going to be the most effective way because it's, it does come up in a number of places. Um, and usually the solution to that, if we keep <coughs> the prohibition in place and try to figure out how to work around it, we think it's going to come back at some point on, on that. So that was our, our thought for going this way. And I was just curious, I know you mentioned one project couldn't be developed just because of a driveway. Do you know offhand just how many have been affected by this? Uh, we had uh, s the, uh, a subdivision project uh, on Spring Hollow that had issues with the driveway curb cut and had some other issues that came up with the 30% slope um, because they were going to be managing the 30% slope by regrading the driveway. So it is a 30% slope, but the finished grade would not be a 30% slope, but they can't touch the 30% slope to not make it a 30% slope. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, the DRB was able to kind of just, you know, kind of take a step back and, and make some determinations, but I, I know the DRB doesn't like <laughs> doing that as much. They would rather kind of have some of the flexibility built into the rules so they have the ability to kind of take a reasonable determination. And when something is just a, a flat out prohibition, there's very little black, there's very little gray, very little flexibility <coughs> in, a, in a prohibition. That was, those were my, my only comments. And the only other question would be, now you were proposing what, a 4,000 square foot or an 8,000? I, I kind of got a little bit lost in the, in trying to take notes uh, the the slopes um, the, the what the table looks at is as the slopes increase um, so if you've got a 15% slope you can't disturb more than 4,000 square feet if it's 20% it's 3,000 square feet if it's 25% it's 2,000 square feet and once you're over 30% doesn't matter how much land you affect you're gonna go to a hearing gotcha. or you're gonna need an engineered plan all right <laughs> there should be a copy of there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, right. Joe. Questions about slopes? Well, I, I'll just say for myself, I um, appreciate this explanation, and this is one of the topics that I had um, been very interested in, and um, you know, in making sure that any changes that we make do end up protecting the uh, uh, you know land in terms of erosion. But I'm glad.
uh, that that's covered in a different section. And um, I think you know having a public hearing makes sense, and having an engineered plan um, is, is probably a, a good space for there to be gray <laughs> um, and give some good discretion. Um, you know, so that we can have driveways, uh, but also. Um, you know, are, are still like there may still be situations where um, it's not appropriate. So yeah, yeah, and we've had a we've had one case where somebody was trying to build at the base of a thirty percent hill. So for them to impact the thirty percent at the bottom was um, was not allowed, even though they really weren't going to be. You usually think of it, oh, if people are building at the top of the hill and think got to watch about things eroding down. Well, if you're at the bottom of the hill, it's just as prohibited. Sure. Even though it's not really going to go anywhere. Um, and you're the one who's going to be affected. Okay, great. Let's really move on, team. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a little bit more complicated. So I gave you two versions of landscaping and screening, and the reason for that is legally what we're going to be proposing to do is to change the strikeout copy, which you got that's red, and what you'll notice is it's almost all red, so I just gave you a clean copy as well because it's a little bit easier you to... Um, to read, so you've got two copies. Um, this is not a complete rewrite, but it is a substantial revision. And the problems with the current version of the landscaping and screening, and landscaping and screening, I should point out, comes up for any site plan. So within a site plan, um, there are a number of requirements you have to have. Uh, the only thing that's really exempt from site plans are single and two-family homes. So most projects uh, will need to have a site plan, and many of them will qualify um, for needing to meet the landscaping and screening requirements. So the problems that came up with the current version was that there were a number of missing administrative rules that kind of came back that are, you know, even somewhat just a little bit wonky. How close does a tree need, tree need to be to count as a, shade, uh, as a shade tree? There was a requirement to have so many trees for so many parking spaces, but then there was nothing that says how close the tree actually has to be to count. You know, 10 feet, 5 feet, 20 feet? Um, there really was no rule, so we kind of had some difficulties there. Just defining tree sizes weren't, wasn't clear in the rules. Uh, how to measure tree setbacks. There was a, a, some rule that said, you know, trees have to be within 10 feet. And we started to think, you know, of, of a of the street, we started to think, is that 10 feet to where the branches stick out, or is it 10 feet measured to the trunk of the tree? It just said 10 feet. And so, you know, there are just things that came up that just needed to be fixed. Rules, uh, second thing, the rules were far too strict and were very inflexible. Again, this comes back to the flexibility piece. So actual example, if your property was required to have 10 trees and 60 shrubs, and you had 12 trees and 25 shrubs, do you need to cut down two trees on your property in order to make room to plant those additional shrubs? I mean, it, it may be that's the case. And that, that kind of seems strange. There's no conversion for if you have, quote, too many trees. Um, because a lot of us were trying to work on very tight lots. Um, and I think these rules were designed much more for a suburban setting where you might have a cleared lot and you're going to plant trees and this is how many trees you have to plant as opposed to working in an actual 4,000 square foot lot that's got this many square feet of building and parking lots and you've got the existing trees, it becomes very difficult. Um, which goes to the next point that there were no grandfathered property rules, so um, it, became, it became tricky for projects that were already developed to meet the new rules and no exemptions for certain applications. So, for example, a change of use that changes nothing on the outside. So a building just has a change of use from a doctor's office to retail. You're not going to change anything on the outside of the building, but because you were a change of use, you would have to go through and make the landscaping changes to meet the new rules. So, as we said, it was just a number of these ones that we really kind of needed to clear up we didn't see them when we proofread it. Um, uh, so what did we change? So exempted projects that uh, we exempted projects that are changes of use, just like the example we talked about. If it's already been developed in accordance with an approved site plan, 
we're not going to make you go through if you're not changing anything on the outside. So if you've got an approved plan and you're doing a change of use, you don't have to change your site plan. Um, we re rearranged one of the figures to define trees. Um, that helped to answer one of our questions. Well, what is a large tree? What is a medium tree? Well, we now have definition. We clarified that if trees meet two sections, they can be counted in each one. We grew planting specifications together. We added some requirements for plantings. Um, we established general standards for street trees, parking, landscaping, screening, and total landscaping. So each of those four ones we'll go through really quick. So street trees, park, parking, screening, and total landscaping. So the general standards, we cleaned up the rules made them easier. Um, we required planting specifications, um, and this goes to the street trees as well. We worked with John Snell to review the street tree requirements. We clarified the administrative rules, how far away can a tree be and count as a street tree. We added some nonconformity rules. We added some waiver rules. Um, so the, it's, it's a lot uh, a lot more flexible and a lot clearer now for what people have to do. With the parking lot landscaping, we clarified some of the rules again. We defined what shade trees are. Um, before, we ju they just said parking lots. And so as administrators, we like to know what we're doing. Um, did that count the aisles between the parking spaces? Or did it just count the parking spaces? Did it count the driveways leading up to that? So we clarified it. it's going to count anything that's impervious um, that relates to those parking lots. And then we, again, we added some non-conforming language because we have some parking lots that just don't meet that today. What, what do those have to meet if you're non-conforming? Um, same with uh, screening. We added some additional clarification rules into screening. And we overall restructured how landscaping and screening was laid out. So before it was kind of mixed in, total landscaping was in the middle. We pulled that to the end. So what we're going to have is street trees, parking lot landscaping, screening, and then total landscaping is at the bottom because really you might meet total landscaping just by the trees you planted on the street, the trees you planted for your parking lot, and the trees you planted for screening. We're going to have a total for landscaping and screening, and what it really is is, is going to look at if you are exempt from street trees and exempt from these other ones, we want you to at least have something. You know, and for a number of projects, they may be exempt or they may be grandfathered and they may, they may be getting a waiver. But at the end, we do want to see some landscaping and screening. And the rules that are in effect today were based on the perimeter of the building. So the bigger the building, the more trees you'd have to have. And it was kind of an odd relationship. The new rules that we worked out is based on impervious cover, so total impervious cover. And we used that as a factor, and there was a lot of experimenting to come up with this. Take your impervious cover square footage, multiply times 0 0.033, and that'll help you get to the amount of required landscaping you need. Um, I could go over examples at the next hearing if you guys are interested, um, but that's kind of, that, that's how it would work now. Minimum planting areas, are, are there, and then we added some nonconformity and waivers. So the idea was just this would be a catch-all at the end um, that we would be able to put in. It is complicated. Um, you don't have to make any decisions tonight, and anyone who has questions, more than welcome to email me questions or comments. Um, for people at home, it's mmiller at montpelier-vt.org, and I can answer any questions people have on the landscaping and screening. As I said, it is a it is a kind of a comprehensive rewrite. Um, I worked very closely with Meredith, who's our zoning administrator, and Audra um, Brown, who is our uh, planning and zoning assistant, to really try to work through these to make sure these new rules, you know, we've we've got them where we think these are going to be effective and and work and not interfere with with projects. So. I didn't have a chance to read this entire thing, but I'm looking at the uh, <coughs> street trees uh, section in the utility standards, 3.203 G2. And 
A says large trees are prohibited where the lowest utility lines are 35 feet or more in height. And then B says large and medium trees are prohibited where the lowest utility lines are less than 35 feet in height. Why don't you just say large trees are prohibited whenever there are overhead utility lines and then medium trees are prohibited when the lowest line is 35 feet or uh, below. That could work as well. <laughs> Any uh, questions regarding screening and uh, landscaping? There's uh, Rosie. one section, um, uh, 3203H, where it's talking about par parking landscaping. And there's an exception, parking landscaping shall not apply to portions of sites used for vehicle sales. And that's one I just want to think about for a second, um, because exempting car dealerships from a lot of these requirements is certainly a choice. And we could decide that that's something we want to do in order to be able to have car dealerships, but we could also decide that that's not a look we want. So I just want to flag that one. Yep, and I'll uh, point out that is an exception that was pulled forward from the current zoning. So that isn't a new recommendation. Um, certainly, as Rosie mm -hmm. points out, that could be that could be uh, stricken, um, but it it would have an impact on um, a number of the dealerships. But that's again, that's a policy policy decision for the board. And so if, if any current or existing car dealerships wanted to make substantial changes that required some kind of a permit, they would have to also then comply with this. So it wouldn't just be for new car dealerships strictly. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, but, and, I, and as I said, I can go into that. That would be um, so people who are trying to, you know, I throw out a lot of the planning lingo with the non-conforming and the grandfathered, but that would be um, if we remove that, then a number of car dealers would be non-conforming, and then they would start to follow these. Um, wherever you'd see, like, number five talks about non-conformities, we would be reading those provisions to decide their application. How would they be treated? Um, where an existing parking area is non-conforming with respect to minimum plantings, but lack sufficient planting area to plant additional trees, the DRB may waive some or all of the landscaping requirements. Um, provided the applicant demonstrates that the development meets landscaper screening requirements to minimize visual impacts on the parking from the street or abutting properties. Um, so they would have a burden to demonstrate to the DRB that they deserve a waiver from those rules, and if the DRB decides against it, then they would have to remove parking area to mm -hmm. meet the rules. Well, that's something that I think we could have some further conversation on, because we're not deciding anything on this tonight. No. Um, so we're going to take this up again, but um, that seems like that's uh, something worth considering. And I'm not necessarily saying that we should change it. Sure. I just, it's a, I th read it and thought it was interesting. Yeah. I guess one thing to think about is future new car dealerships are hopefully likely to be electric car dealerships and maybe we don't want to discourage those. I, right. So yeah. many policy implications. Right. So. There's <laughs> exactly, or if uh, the, the current ones wanted to install a lot of EV charging stations and they, and somehow it was, uh, if they were, if they were going to do that and it required some kind of a permit and then it'd be much more expensive if we required them to do this also. Yeah. Interesting questions. I mean, they, they could have a green car dealership, you know, with a rain gardens on the outside <laughs> of it or something creative. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, I assume the policy is that uh, <coughs> if you have a car dealership, you don't want your inventory to be screened because you want people to drive by and see, see the, the cars, cars and right. be attracted to buy them. So. Rain gardens are short. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe we would say that that's not, that car dealerships could go other places in the state, but also then people have to drive to them, so. <laughs> Fair. Okay, I'll let it go. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm glad you brought it, brought it up. That's, that's good. Any other uh, things to flag for further conversation or comments? 
about any of this? And you can still bring stuff up next time as well. So, Mike, do you need them to set a hearing date for this? Uh, yes, we should set a, a hearing date. I'm trying to see if I put that. We're missing a calendar, Bill. Oh. So th actually, we've ordered one, <laughs> and <laughs> the the type yeah. that we like, we can't seem to find. So we're still searching for them. Right. They're, they're back order. Well, so I was I trying. was specifically informed to tell you that if it came up, we have not <laughs> ignored the request for calendar. But the one with the, the three months, and then when you flip, it's still the yes. So yes. we do have over there though the uh, the upcoming meeting. So the thirteenth and the twenty seventh. Or our next two meetings. And the next two meetings. Um, do we have a minimum amount of time we need to have to notice the uh, public hearing on it? Either one of these would probably be fine. Yeah, I, I would imagine, but either uh, one was would be. It's, it's currently tentatively on for the next meeting, but you hadn't set that. Oh so. yeah, so could the, right the second from the from the bottom zoning public yeah. hearing. Let's assume that it's fine. Yeah, we can I think double it check. Just needs a 15 day notice, and we're still in February, so. Yeah, but barely. But barely though, tomorrow's yeah, I might not be able to make it actually. 13 and one is 14. Yeah. It's only 14 usually days from now. Usually hearings require 15 days. Okay. Well, maybe so we should go with the 27th and the April 10th. But it's only going to require one. So oh, it, it's can, only it can be oh. start on the 27th. and. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought it took two. To, okay. No. no. Not to meet the zoning unless there's charter overrules the adoption. No. Okay. Uh, so we're going to aim for the 27th then? Just to be safe? Okay. Yes. Who would, was there a motion? I move we schedule a public hearing on this proposed ordinance for April 20, for March 27th. I'll second. Further discussion? Uh, all right, so we're voting on the um, public hearing for the 27th of March on uh, the uh, voting zoning fixes. Uh, all right, so any further discussion? Uh, Just to thank Mike, what your comments were helped me put things on an orderly way, and when I go to oh. back to we go back through it, it very helpful. So thank you. Okay. Very yeah. Yep. Okay. Further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Super. Thank you. And right. thanks for printing these. Oh yes. It's yes. Only way it's I new. can. The only way I can get through it. Right okay, so we are on to the public hearing on the uh, proposed charter amendment. So I'm going to move back to my seat over there. I don't think we need a break. Does anyone else feel like they need a break? Wouldn't you mind one at some point? At eight, by 8.30? Okay. Well, this might be the time to do it because the agenda is not that long. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're almost done. I figured we had another two I hours. Know, right? uh, out of here by then. Yeah, why don't we just do it before the executive no. session? Yeah, that could be, that could be good. Okay, um, so I'm going to um, uh, open the public hearing on this uh, proposed charter amendment. So uh, I'll just note that the statutes require a public hearing, a uh, public informational meeting on proposed charter changes um, within 10, I believe it's 10 days of the vote. So this is meeting that requirement. You do have a proposed charter change on uh, the ballot. This is a chance for anybody to ask questions to explain what the charter change is about. I don't know, maybe someone wants to give a quick overview for the viewers. Uh, Sure, <laughs> I can do that. Uh, so the uh, proposed uh, charter language um, uh, is uh, regarding um, energy efficiency uh, in residential and commercial buildings and uh, disclosure. Uh, and so uh, there were three uh, uh, ordinances that were imagined to go along with, uh, with this, though it is uh, uh, relatively broad, and we'll, uh, we invite a lot of public discussion. Any, um, you know, to any um, you know, before any actual ordinance uh, is enacted, and definitely want to be thoughtful about that process. So the couple of ordinances uh, that uh, we've talked about thus far, one is an ordinance similar to uh, Burlington's, where they they have a, a ordinance that says that 
anytime a multifamily building is sold, uh, that a building must meet certain energy efficiency uh, performance standards, uh, which is a, uh, that's, that's a great time to be doing um, uh, energy efficiency work. And as a part of the sale, uh, it can be, uh, you know, relatively speaking, a, a smaller percentage of the, or smallish percentage of the total sale of the building. Um, so that, that helps. Um, and uh, that's a, a way to also protect uh, uh, renters, particularly from uh, having to pay a lot in uh, heat. Um, so that's uh, one uh, ordinance. And then the another one that we've uh, talked about is around um, home energy disclosures. So uh, as a matter of, uh, you know, as part of the sale of a home, uh, one would hope that uh, the energy information of that home would be available to the buyer. And uh, theoretically, that ought to be uh, standardized. So, like, you wouldn't buy a car without knowing the gas mileage of that car. And uh, though you and I might drive a car differently, um, that gas mileage is uh, standardized. And so, the same. This is this uh, potentially could be a similar sort of uh, tool for uh, homeowners that they have an apples to apples comparison of uh, the energy assets of a home. And those um, energy uh, uh, profiles uh, assessments. Uh, typically cost only about $250. So again, on the scale of selling a, a home, that's uh, relatively insignificant, uh, relatively speaking. So um, that's uh, a couple of them. Another one was just uh, thinking about uh, who pays for heat. So in buildings where uh, uh, that are that are not uh, particularly energy efficient, uh, one possibility is that uh, you know, the tenants are paying for the heat. And in that situation, if a tenant's paying for heat, in a particularly inefficient home, um, then the landlord has no financial incentive anyway to do energy improvement work in that space. And so um, one possibility is that we could say, you know, the, the landlord ought to be responsible for paying for the heat if the building is, um, is not uh, energy efficient. So all of those are um, up for future conversations. Um, and uh, we don't have necessarily the authority to do those things now, and so that's what this um, charter would allow, uh, this charter change would allow us to do. So anyway, that's the, the long-winded um, overview, but you know, the hope here is to provide uh, better protections for renters and to increase the, uh, the value of uh, homes for landlords as well as um, rewarding good landlords uh, who have done energy efficiency work. It'll make them, uh, or give them a, a competitive advantage um, if they've done energy efficiency work, and we think that's a good thing. Uh, and then uh, uh, in addition, uh, it's uh, consumer protection for anybody buying a home. So there we are. So the public hearing is open. Any comments from anybody? Yes, welcome. <laughs> On my way out, <clears throat> I, I just hope that the, in the next stage of discussion, there'll be some serious thought given to possibility of unintended outcomes. Specifically, if landlords are required to do certain things, what's to stop them from passing those costs along to tenants? And I liked reading what you said and what Ashley said. This is part of a larger conversation. And I think it needs to be more clearly communicated that what you're doing now is simply asking think, if I understand yes, it, yes. the legislature for permission to have that conversation. Yes. But it would help, I think, to be clear, clearer about that at the outset. I think we could have not had so much to do about it. But that, that larger conversation, I think, might, for example, want to include incentives for landlords to do this, carrot and stick. So I, I'm looking forward to that conversation. Yes, I fully agree. Carrots and sticks together uh, are important. I agree. Thank you. Further comments, questions? I don't. So just the one thing I flagged already before, but I'm um, particularly concerned about the impact on historic buildings. And so as the council continues this discussion, making sure to bring in the historic preservation folks um, and our committees and, and getting that. Um, that voice at the table. Thank you. Yeah, that's important. Thank you for that flag. Okay. Um, seeing nobody else, uh, I'm going to close the public hearing and uh,
we don't need to do anything, any nope. further action on that. Um, we did that. Okay, so on to this uh, parklet discussion. So we have a question about uh, whether the parklets can this be, if it can be under construction prior to correct. May Correct. This is really, we had a request, um, you know, we, as you recall, we spent some time last year on the ordinance, and uh, it says the, the, the parklets may be maintained and operated uh, beginning May 1st until October 25th of each year. And the question came to us at staff, you know, can we start building it so that we can operate it on May 1st? Or do we have to wait till May 1st to start building? And we all had different opinions about <laughs> <laughs> what that meant and what, how we might respond. And we thought there was still enough time that we would bring it back and just, you know, this doesn't really necessarily require a formal action or, or amendment just a question of what your intent is or your policy would be on that so we can provide guidance and then at some later point we can amend the ordinance if, if necessary but uh, we just wanted to get a sense of if you all had any strong opinions on one way or the other. I have thoughts on this but I'll defer to you all first. I also have thoughts. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one is that if we were going to allow people to um, take more time, I would certainly want to adjust the charge accordingly because they would be using up parking spaces during those times. Um, I was also concerned by the comment in here that it took a number of days five, to take apart days. the parklet, given that I think one of our requirements is that it be removable in an emergency. Um, so if it takes that many days to deconstruct it, kind of seems like maybe it's not removable in an emergency and that seems like a concern. Fair. Done. I really saw the dates as that's when they can start, that's when they can take the streets and not before and not after. That's how I saw it. Jack. I agree with that. I think it, when we were adjusting the dates uh, earlier this year, I think that uh, one of the concerns we were balancing was how much time would those spaces be taken away from parking? And yep. so I think the entire time they're taken away out of parking service is covered in that time period. Yep. That's Do you want anything, Glenn? I, I agree with what's been said. Okay. Done. Which will hopefully give them motivation to make the assembly and disassembly <laughs> really simple and straightforward. <laughs> now, they did say five days to assemble it, so that might be longer than when they disassemble it and reassemble it the next time. So. Uh, I also had similar thoughts. That Perfect. That's, the I that's ideal clarity. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we need to get Good. talk about it I need any no further. longer. Okay, great. And you don't need a motion, so. No. Okay, great. So that... Uh, concludes our regular business. We do have an executive session. We have your council reports. And, and council that. reports. Uh, all right. Uh, Rosie, would you like to go first or last? I'll go first. OK. Um, I wanted to thank all of you all for being a pleasure to work with and engaging with me on some really dorky policy discussions <laughs> and <laughs> indulging me on going down some meanderings about car dealerships and all <laughs> kinds of future policy implications that um, are very minute in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I also really wanted to thank the city staff, and that has been one of the real pleasures of doing this job, is getting to learn how everything works within the city um, and taking all the tours and meeting all the staff and really learning what um, an exceptional staff we have. Um, and, you know, the folks doing some of the thankless tasks that the rest of the city doesn't really see, but we really count on. Um, so that, that has been a wonderful opportunity. I hope that maybe someday there will be a Montpelier Day and everyone in the community yes. will get a chance to um, take those tours and learn from those staff what they do and, and take some time to appreciate that. Um, so that's, that's you know, I, I leave this knowing so much more about my community um, than I knew before and having a much greater appreciation for it and knowing who to call whenever I see something. <laughs> so, um, and I also wanted to just express to you all that I, um, I'm not going away. I look forward to maybe someday, or someday in the near future, participating on um, some committees and um, doing something that's a little bit more at the level that I can afford out of my you know, time right now. Um, but it's 
I certainly want to continue to be involved. So you'll probably see me uh, looking for a nomination to some committee at some point. Yay. And that's it. Yay. Uh, Jack, do you want to go next? Yes, I'll try not to be too emotional about this, but I, I never knew Rosie until she was on the council two years ago, and it's been a great pleasure both being coming before the council and working with Rosie on the council. I think you're a model for a public servant, and I'll really miss you. Thanks, Jack. Thanks a lot. Uh, Glenn or Don? Uh, thanks, Rosie. Uh, and I'll see you soon, I'm sure. And uh, anyone else who would like to talk with me tomorrow morning at Baggy Do's, 8.30 to 9.30. Um, I have really been enjoying that time, especially recently. Um, and I'll also mention I've been uh, going occasionally to uh, Another Ways uh, community meetings that they have once a week on Monday afternoons. I'm hoping to continue doing that. Uh, I'm really excited about learning more about Another Way, and I think they're doing fantastic work. So uh, I will be talking more about them in the future, I think. Uh, yes, Rosie, thank you, thank you. You've applied not only your unique style to the City Council, but broadening all our awareness for details. And it doesn't mean that I can change my ways, but I'm glad you were here and that you've added so much to the City Council. I truly appreciate that you recognize the staff because I too think that the community needs to know more and about our departments and our staff. So I will keep the Montpelier Day in mind. <laughs> and that you're willing to come back one thing that I really uh, pleased me with Nancy Sherman when she got off the council, she came back and was on committee after committee. And so I'm glad that you're not going to just disappear. You're allowed a little rest, okay? But <laughs> if you do come back, you have a lot to contribute. Thanks, Donna. So my favorite rosy story. Is, <laughs> <laughs> is this a roast? <laughs> no. Well, uh, I remember um, the vacant lot ordinance and I was a city councilor sitting over there, and uh, I remember you didn't you didn't like the vacant lot ordinance. Or it's not vacant lot; um, it's the nuisance building. Nuisance building. Thank you. Building. That's the one. Yeah. Vacant buildings. I was, I was thinking, but anyway, uh, and and you had all these these uh, reasons why it was not great, and we ended up changing that ordinance and uh, you know amending it in all these different ways that. You know reasons that you had suggested like no, this is not good for these reasons and in the end you didn't vote for it but like that to me <laughs> was like <laughs> sorry maybe this is not a great story but, <laughs> but that, it is. That, it that to is. me was like so uh just just wonderful right that you yeah. were willing yeah. to say here here's why uh you know here's what i believe in and here's uh you know detail oriented like why this uh, could be better and why this is not good as it is and I think we ended up with a better ordinance in general. And I, I thought you have always just uh, dissented with respect whenever you did. And I think that is incredibly admirable. And so I'm so grateful to have uh, served with you and um, look forward to continuing to have you participate in things. So thank you. Thanks, Ann. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a good example. You win when you don't even win the vote you wanted, but you yeah. influenced it. See? I mean, I wish we hadn't passed it. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, but anyway, I was very grateful um, for, for that and, and just all of your contributions. Uh, and I guess I would just, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to add, which is that I'm uh, working on uh, this office space just uh, beyond this wall, and so I'm hoping to have office hours. Um, in the oh, near cool. future, so that should be good. Yay. Yeah, so anyway, that's it for me. Well, um, first I wanna say, I'm, I know I'm Mr. Curmudgeon over here, but I, I hope you <laughs> you know that I really appreciate your, your contributions here, and I know everybody does, and you're gonna be, you're gonna be missed. So it's good to hear that you're going to be staying around. Um, I should also mention a couple things that are more boring and businessy. Early voting is virtually non-existent compared to other other elections, so I don't know what that means. Uh, we're we're working against the trend there. Um, 
I do still have some needs on election day. There are still a couple people here who haven't signed up uh, or who are, uh, to the extent they're available. And not everyone here is available, so I would encourage, in particular, um, strictly speaking, I've got seven slots left, but really the one to four slot is where I need one more to feel safe. Um, uh, let's see, beyond that, what have I got? Uh, I don't know if you all want the quick 411 on last November's past charter changes because this is the week they're all happening or you just want to wait and I can tell you what happens afterwards. <laughs> I know there's a, you've got a lot to talk about <laughs> yet. So do you all sure. want to hear what's going sure. on? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. There's hearings on both of them in House Government Operations this week. Um, the hearing on plastic bags is going to be uh, Friday, and we've got a few folks who are going to be coming in to, to talk about that. I'm not hearing a lot of pushback on that at all. I'm not hearing much of anything at all, which is sort of interesting and peculiar. Um, I, and I, you know, looking at the, the list, I'm not seeing that there's going to be anybody really coming out against it, so I think it's, it's probably looking pretty good. We'll see how it goes. Um, Non-citizen voting is a little more complicated. Uh, because the uh, Ledge Council, uh, what we, we understand is that they were initially preparing to, to suggest that it is unconstitutional in regards to the Vermont Constitution. Now we have several attorneys, or a few attorneys, you know, of note on our side in this. Dan Richardson, of course, who, who helped us draw it up. Um, also, um, Peter Teachout has weighed in. Uh, in favor of the constitutionality of, of, the, of the proposal. And the two of them have, have been in discussions with legislative council, and I think there's, there's going to be a little bit softening there um, to, to create less of a, a stark report. So I think there will be uh, a, little, a little light there that can shine through that uh, may enable this, this committee, which I have a feeling wants to pass it, to pass it. We've got uh, a lot of folks who are going to be testifying in support. We've got the city clerk from Tacoma Park, Maryland, who they've been doing this for years, and who is also going to be able to testify in support of the plastic bag ban because they've been doing that for years. Um, so, but anyways, that's that's where we're at basically. Is that also a hearing on Friday? That hearing, sorry, that's that's going to be on Thursday, and 10 o'clock uh, is set aside for the the committee just to hear from legislative council and I'll have Sheila there to take notes and then um, uh, then it's going to be everyone else's turn 345 which is a very odd time especially since we've got a lot of people who are going to want to want to weigh in on that um, but that's that's where it's at now it's changed a few times but that seems to be where we've landed okay um, so I'll start with the easy stuff first. Just some of you may have noticed um, last couple weeks I did this thing called Meet the Manager at North Branch Cafe, stealing Glenn's idea and the coffee with a cop. The, we had very small turnout, but um, interesting conversations. I believe I um, wasn't able to do it this week or next, but we'll probably try to do it at least monthly after that, just one more way, and maybe change some times of day to the, the morning. doesn't always work for everybody. So. Uh, but had some had some interesting conversations. Um, I think our projects are all moving along as expected. I'm going to do that. So I'll I'll join the chorus of of Rosie fans. Um, it's it's a measure of my appreciation that I came back from D.C. so I could be at your last meeting to say <laughs> this to you in person. Um, I I have had worked with over 30 city council members and my tenure here and probably 40 if I count all of my you know, various jobs. And I've, in no disrespect of the other folks sitting around the table, <laughs> but I uh, have never worked with someone as diligent and responsive and thorough as you. And it's, uh, you've made us all better. You've made our staff better. Um, and I mean that in a good way. We sit, right? We sit at our meeting saying, what's Rosie gonna ask? <laughs> <laughs> But it, it means that we've, it makes us think more. So you have, you have upped the game of all of us. I appreciate it. I appreciate that 
when you first came on, we were talking about things, and I said, you know, I really want to have regular check-ins with council members, and immediately you got in touch with me and said, okay, let's set up a time, and since then, every Monday at noon, we've had a chat, or virtually every Monday, and I found that to be very helpful. Just sometimes we just laugh about stuff, and sometimes we get into a really heavy-duty conversation, but we got a good chance to know everybody was at, and it was, um, you know, always happy to do that with anybody so thank you for your service to the city and I, I uh, echo council members McCullough's comments that you are what public service is all about and it's been a privilege to work with you so. thanks Bill Appreciate it. okay uh, so we have an executive session to go into at this point um, so we have a motion and we are not going to be taking any uh, action in public afterwards. I move to go into executive session pursuant to Title I DSA Section 313 related to uh, attendance.